Hi, it's Katrina. Secrets of Atlantis Around the year 1650 BC, there was a great volcanic eruption in the Mediterranean. This eruption was so immense that it blanketed the island of Santorini in about 200 feet of ash. It killed every life form on the island and utterly obliterated the city-state that had been living there, a part of the Minoan civilization. This is important to know for one key reason. The great Greek philosopher Plato wrote about a place called Atlantis around 360 BC. That was 1,300 years after Santorini was devastated by the eruption. In his writings, Plato described Atlantis as having been a highly advanced city that had once besieged Athens with an immense naval force. The Minoans could fit that description. Shortly after, the island was punished by the gods for their selfish and greedy ways and sank. Ever since Plato wrote these words, people have been trying to figure out if Atlantis was a real place or not. The actual location of Atlantis has been hugely debated, with some saying it was near the Caribbean, others Antarctica, the Greek islands, Morocco, it could be anywhere. Ancient objects discovered in 2020 from the days before Santorini's city-state was destroyed point to Santorini being the location of Atlantis. Archaeologists agree that the culture on the island flourished 3,000 years ago, but some researchers believe the culture was around way before that and that this was a major civilization. When researchers began combing through the buried structures looking for artifacts, they found incredible frescoes decorating the walls of the homes. And while the frescoes are mostly destroyed, it's not impossible to see what they had once depicted. In many of these pictures, there are clearly exotic animals, bright flowers, and everything showing a literal paradise. These frescoes alone are enough to suggest Atlantis could have been on the island of Santorini. Hi guys! Excuse the brief interruption, but I just wanted to let you all know that we are now on Spotify! Origins Explained is now available on the free Spotify app and Spotify.com, so you have even more ways to join us. Listen and follow along for new episodes every week. Check out the link in the description box and be sure to share with your friends, your family, your mom, your teacher, your neighbor. You get it. See you there! The Vindolanda Fort The Vindolanda Fort in England was a Roman auxiliary barracks near Hadrian's Wall. This was at the furthest reach of the Roman Empire. Hadrian's Wall marked the boundary between the empire and what they considered being the barbaric tribes living beyond, tribes that the Romans never conquered. The fort itself was built sometime around the year 85 AD and was occupied until the year 370. You can think of it as a garrison of troops set up at the end of the Roman world to protect Roman Britain from an attack by the tribes living in what is today Scotland. And while the fort has been known to archaeologists for decades, something new has just been discovered. Retired biochemist Dylan Herbert was volunteering at the Vindolanda fort doing some research when he accidentally discovered a carved phallus. This carved human organ was quite large and came included with an insult carved into the stone over it. It's believed the Roman graffiti was left behind by a soldier stationed here and was intended for another soldier. The insult is too lewd to be repeated here, but it's the same thing you could find these days written on any bathroom stall. Researchers say graffiti hasn't really changed at all since the Roman times. They were the first to draw giant phalluses as a hobby and leave behind rude insults for their fellow soldiers. Petra Breakthrough In a surprising new discovery, archaeologists have come across an ancient scroll in the city of Petra. You might recognize Petra as the lost city in the desert carved directly into the stone. The ruins go back over 2,000 years, and even though the area has been studied since the 1800s, there are new things to be discovered. Archaeologists have uncovered a document that had been forgotten inside a cave in Petra that dates back 2,000 years, just like the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. But in this case, the scroll isn't full of religious texts or the details of secret rituals. Instead, it gives information about the life of a Nabataean woman by the name of Abi Adan. She lived in the 1st century AD and had traveled to Petra from the Dead Sea in search of opportunities and a better life. Professor Hannah Cotton Paltiel of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem is an expert on the scrolls and says that she had an orchard of date trees near the Dead Sea that she was selling. Reportedly, they were right next to the lands of the Nabataean king himself, meaning they were well taken care of and in a good neighborhood. The documents prove that she knew how to read and write and could own property. She may have been a wealthy and influential woman in the kingdom, and these scrolls are official legal documents, not just scribbles. 
Professor John Healy from the University of Manchester said that in the Kingdom of Nabatea, it seems women could own and transfer property and had agency, unlike women in many other parts of the ancient world. In Greece and Rome, women were not equals under the law, but here women could be in the company of men and could divorce and serve as witnesses in court cases. The city of Petra was at the heart of Nabataean culture. These people accumulated a massive amount of wealth by trading on the Silk Road. This was a major hub for caravans, traveling merchants, and all kinds of traders from many different cultures would come here to live. Jealousy in the neighboring empires of Greece and Rome led to warfare, and although the Greeks were unsuccessful, the Romans defeated the Nabataeans about 400 years later. Then, after 250 years of occupation, the Roman Empire deserted Petra, and it was lost for centuries. The Settlement of Xiol In Mexico, the ancient Maya settlement of Xiol was recently uncovered for the first time in history. This amazing settlement, located only a handful of miles from downtown Merida, the capital of the Yucatan Peninsula, was once a thriving hub. Researchers dated it to being occupied between 600 and 900 AD, making the buildings more contemporary than in other Maya cities such as Uxmal or Chichen Itza. Since the discovery of Xiol a few years ago, more and more things have been found here. In 2020, over 38 burials were detected, lost on the outskirts of the city, with the graves filled with ritual offerings. And more recently, seven new buildings were found. These buildings are nothing but ruins, but archaeologists found the scraps of the material that had been used to build them. And interestingly enough, the material used to build these structures came from pretty far away. The researchers identified scraps of volcanic rock, which had been brought from Guatemala. This shows that even near the end of the Maya Empire, they had a sophisticated network that could transport huge loads of material from one end of the kingdom to the other. And they used this network to build great cities, right until a massive drought caused the Maya Empire to collapse around 1,000 years ago. I want to give a big shout out to Franklin and Neil Jackson. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos about amazing discoveries. More Saqqara Mummies Archaeologists working in the ancient Egyptian cemetery at Saqqara have just discovered even more mummies. Not just a few, but hundreds of ancient Egyptian coffins, as well as fantastically preserved bronze statues of various Egyptian gods. Gods such as Anubis, Amun, Osiris, Isis, Bastet, and Hathor. They even found a headless statue of the pharaoh Imhotep, who handled the construction of the Saqqara Pyramid. According to the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, they found 250 coffins and 150 bronze statues. These objects all date back to the late period of Egypt, around 500 BC. The archaeologists even found ancient musical instruments. They discovered a sistrum, which was a percussion instrument that kind of looked like a torture device. It was used during religious ceremonies and whenever it was believed that a deity had been summoned during a ritual. As for the coffins, they were pretty standard for this era in Egyptian history. They were painted wooden coffins, with each one containing its very own mummy. One carving even contained a papyrus written in hieroglyphics. Researchers believe it is a fragment of the legendary Book of the Dead, a tool used by Egyptian priests to help spirits move on to the underworld. Pompeii Human Genome the ancient city of Pompeii just keeps revealing more and more secrets. Even though the city was discovered by archaeologists many, many years ago, researchers are still finding more amazing things buried in the rubble from when the city was destroyed. As you probably know, Pompeii was the city unfortunate enough to be in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius when it erupted in 79 AD. The volcanic ash blanketed the city, petrifying people in blocks of stone as if they had been in a staring contest with Medusa. But this newest discovery isn't exactly archaeological. What scientists have done now is successfully sequence the very first genome of a victim of the Mount Vesuvius eruption. Researchers looked at the remains of two individuals who were discovered in a building called the House of the Craftsman. This building was uncovered right in the center of Pompeii, basically downtown. They took DNA from these people, distilled it, and sequenced the genomes. One skeleton had fragments missing from its genome, but the other was a major success. Scientists now know that this victim was a man between 35 and 40 when he died. They also know he shared very similar DNA to modern Italians. This guy is probably somebody's direct relative living in Italy right now. The Lost Colonists 
In August 1587, a group of roughly 115 English settlers arrived off the coast of North Carolina on Roanoke Island. This was a new colony in the New World, and these were some of the very first people from Europe to ever lay their eyes on North America. The leader and governor of the new colony was a man named John White. John sailed back to England and was planning to load up on fresh supplies and return soon after. But because war had broken out between England and Spain, he didn't make it back to the colony until August 1590. That was three years later. And when he got there, expecting to find the colonists and his wife and daughter, they were gone. There was no trace of them. There were no bodies. And the only clue was a single word carved into a wooden post. Croatoan. For the last almost 500 years, historians have been trying to figure out what happened to the colonists of Roanoke Island. And finally, it looks like we have some answers. Recent archaeological excavations on Hatteras Island have allegedly solved the case. According to project leader Scott Dawson, he and his team uncovered proof that the colonists hadn't simply vanished. They had actually been taken in by the Croatoan natives who lived with them peacefully on a different island. The colonists were never lost. They'd simply moved on and integrated themselves with the natives. The evidence for this comes in lost European artifacts on the island from the 16th century, an Elizabethan rapier, a writing table with English letters, and other ordinary objects. The only thing that's missing are the actual colonists. A Hasmonean Farming Complex Archaeologists in Israel have just come across a fascinating agricultural complex from about 2,000 years ago. This complex can be traced back to the Hasmonean period. The Hasmoneans ruled over all of Judea and the surrounding regions from roughly 140 BC until 37 BC. It was when King Herod the Great came to power that Judea turned into a vassal state of Rome and the dynasty ended. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, this new complex was found in eastern Galilee. Inside the ruins of the structure, archaeologists found dozens of old tools, things once used for plowing and tending to crops. They even found weights that had once been used for weaving fabrics, along with several coins from about 2,200 years ago. All of this stuff appears to have just been left behind, which suggests that whoever lived here fled abruptly when the Hasmoneans came to the area and conquered it. Alexandria's Sunken Treasures In the Mediterranean Sea, just off the coast of Egypt's Alexandria, a warship has just been found. This ship was from ancient Greece and sank thousands of years ago in Alexandria's Abu Kir Bay. Even more amazing is the fact that the ship was discovered buried underneath an ancient funerary temple. This temple dates back to the 4th century BC and was once part of the port city of Taunus Heraklion. The city of Taunus Heraklion was destroyed about 2,000 years ago by an earthquake and the tsunami that came after. The city was standing one day, and the next it had completely collapsed into the Mediterranean. An entire city just wiped off the map in a single day. It looks like the ship was actually destroyed when the funerary temple collapsed sideways onto it. This temple must have been at the very edge of the city, right beside the port. When its enormous stone blocks started falling apart, the thing tipped over and landed on a boat. Then both of them sank and were eventually covered by about 15 feet of solidified mud along with the rest of the city. Stonehenge Land Use Geophysical sensors, powerful computers, and new excavations have revealed fascinating insights into Stonehenge. Not the henge itself, but the land where it sits. Researchers from the University of Birmingham found what appeared to be prehistoric pits, several hundred of them, scattered across the landscape near Stonehenge. A large pit dug into the chalky bedrock stands out as the oldest trace of land use discovered. They also found several thousand much smaller pits that look like boreholes. Think of these as empty holes in the ground after a fence post has been taken out. These mysterious holes were discovered by completing a geophysical survey. The scientists used electromagnetic induction to reveal anomalies in the ground. They also used a computer to generate thousands of subsurface features, like these mysterious pits. But what does all this mean? The pits come from around 10,000 years ago and 3,300 years ago. That means they range from the early Mesolithic to the Middle Bronze Age. People had been living at this exact spot, all along the outskirts of Stonehenge, for a period of around 7,000 years, maybe even more. The pits were probably dug as hunting traps. They would have been used by the hunters to trap red deer and wild boar, and even the extinct aurochs. 
This fresh evidence goes to show that way before Stonehenge was one of the first observatories ever made, the land was bustling with nomadic, cave-dwelling hunters. Recent Chernobyl Radioactivity In recent months, Russian forces moved to seize the Chernobyl nuclear plant in Ukraine. Without radiation protection, they drove their vehicles through a highly toxic area known as the Red Forest. The activity kicked up radioactive dust clouds, which one Chernobyl employee said they likely inhaled. Shortly after Russia invaded the country, Ukrainian nuclear officials said that the vehicles had caused a verifiable increase in radiation levels at Chernobyl. The Red Forest is the most contaminated part of the exclusion zone. Even the experts who work at the plant aren't allowed to go there for safety reasons begging the question of why anyone in their right mind would drive through it unprotected. One Ukrainian worker, who is still working at the site while it remains under Russian control, told Reuters that some Russian soldiers he spoke with had never heard of the catastrophic nuclear disaster at the site in 1986, and they reportedly ignored warnings from Chernobyl's staff members to be cautious about radiation. In early April, News reports claimed that some Russian soldiers had left the site after coming down with radiation sickness. They had allegedly been digging trenches in the Red Forest as if driving through it wasn't dangerous enough when they quickly became very sick and decided it was time to go somewhere else. Do you think the Russians did this on purpose, or were they just being careless? Hammerhead Worm The hammerhead worm is a flatworm that typically grows between 8 and 15 inches long. Named for its hammer or shovel-shaped head, the species is predatory and capable of unlimited self-cloning. It's also the only known land animal that contains the same toxin as pufferfish. While it's unknown how dangerous hammerhead worms are to humans, experts recommend playing it safe and washing your hands after coming into contact with one. The hammerhead worm may or may not have eyes, and it has a single opening on one end that functions as both a mouth and an anus. It reproduces by leaving part of its body, such as part of its tail, stuck to something, and the piece then develops into an entirely new worm. If someone cuts one of these worms into pieces, all the parts will become new worms. This is called fragmentation. This species is native to Asia, it preys on earthworms, which has negative consequences for the soil. Earthworm activity helps aerate the soil and turns it into organic compost, so the ground is a lot less healthy without them. Hammerhead worms have been seen in many parts of the United States, including California and Florida. They appeared in parts of southern and central Maine last fall and were spotted again recently, so it seems that they are there to stay. Scientists are unsure how these Asian natives got to the United States. An Altar of Skulls In 2012, police in Chiapas, Mexico, responded to the reported discovery of around 150 human skulls in a cave. They initially thought they had encountered a modern crime scene, especially considering the region's reputation for drug-related violence and human trafficking. Authorities also believed that the remains might be recent because they were left intact unlike the piles of smashed skull fragments that are often found at ancient sites. But they held off on drawing any definitive conclusions until experts examined the bones. Researchers from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History determined that these skulls were over 1,000 years old. Most of them belonged to women, except for three infants, and none of them had teeth. Because the remains consisted mostly of skulls, Experts believe that the collection represents a sompantli, or altar of skulls. The Aztecs and other Mesoamerican cultures use these arrangements to display the skulls of human sacrifice victims. Evidence of wooden sticks, which were used for building these structures, further supports the idea. The discovery highlights the need for archaeologists to continue their research in the region, according to Inna anthropologist Javier Montes de Paz. In addition, he urged members of the public to come forward if they discover anything that they believe may be of historic interest. Suspected Brain Cancer Cluster Over 100 people who graduated from Colonia High School in Woodbridge, New Jersey, have been diagnosed with brain tumors over the last 30 years, 
sparking concerns that a cancer cluster might exist. Colonia graduate and environmental scientist Al Lupiano was diagnosed with a large benign brain tumor in 1999 at age 27. He was treated successfully for the rare condition but became suspicious when his wife, who also went to Colonia, was diagnosed with the same type of tumor. Lupiano's sister was then diagnosed with a rare and aggressive brain cancer called glioblastoma, which unfortunately took her life. He did some research and began finding that more people who attended the school ended up with brain tumors. As a result, the city has hired experts to perform radiation tests. In addition, the local mayor has reassured the public that if they don't find any meaningful results, they will begin looking into other potential connections. Cancer expert Elizabeth A. Platts told Live Science that multiple cancer cases in the same area don't point toward a cluster. Identifying a cluster involves determining a higher than expected number of cancer cases in a population while taking age, gender, location, and other factors into account. But she acknowledged that the disturbing trend among Colonia graduates needs to be investigated, no questions asked. Submerged Human Corpses Lake Mead is Nevada's largest reservoir and one of the biggest reservoirs in the United States. For the last decade, it's been plagued by droughts and plummeting water levels, and this year is no exception. The receding waters recently exposed a human corpse in a barrel dumped into the lake over 30 years ago. Based on the decomposed body's clothing and footwear, authorities believe they died sometime between the mid-1970s and the early 80s. It appears as though the person was male and was shot to death in a homicide. His identity remains a mystery. Just days later after this discovery, also in 2022, someone called the police to report the discovery of skeletal human remains, including a jawbone with attached teeth, on an exposed sandbar in Lake Mead. Here, authorities said that there's no evidence of foul play. The jawbone was found by sisters Lindsay and Lynette Melvin, paddleboarding on the lake when they explored the sandbar. They initially thought the remains belonged to a bighorn sheep, but they realized the bones were human when they noticed the jaw and the teeth. Lynette Melvin told ABC News that she and Lindsay hope that the deceased person's family gets answers and that their soul can rest peacefully. These recent discoveries have reignited rumors about mafia assassins dumping bodies into Lake Mead. Mob historian Joff Schumacher told ABC that the Mafia disposed of bodies and barrels starting as far back as the 1880s. He believes that more shocking discoveries will be made as the lake continues to recede. Mystery Monkey In 2017, photos of a strange mystery monkey spotted in Malaysian Borneo began appearing on social media. It caught the attention of scientists, who've recently analyzed images of the female primate and suspect that she's a hybrid between a proboscis monkey and a silvery langur. While it's not unheard of for closely related species from the same evolutionary group to interbreed, the proboscis monkey and silvery langur differ significantly and are from separate groups. Proboscis monkeys have pink faces with elongated noses and weigh up to 53 pounds. Silvery langurs have black faces with short noses and are much smaller, weighing roughly 14 and a half pounds on average. Study co-author and primatologist Nadine Ruppert told Life Science that it appears as though the two species are living in mixed groups based on witness observations. The researchers believe male proboscis monkeys may use their size to dominate langur groups and force the males to leave. The case is also shocking because when two distantly related animals interbreed, their offspring are usually sterile, yet the mystery monkey has been seen with a baby. Of course it's possible that she was taking care of another monkey's baby, but the scientists noticed she appeared to be lactating, showing that she did reproduce biologically. The discovery is interesting, but it's also disturbing for the researchers who attribute the interbreeding to the two species being crammed into a rapidly shrinking habitat because of deforestation. The hybrid monkey is just another unsettling example of how human activity threatens biodiverse regions that desperately need protection. Unexplained Hepatitis Outbreak In recent weeks, news headlines have reported on nearly 200 cases of unexplained hepatitis in children throughout the world. A strange outbreak started a few months ago, and at least nine kids in the United States have been affected. Most of the patients getting the condition are less than 10 years old. 
Hepatitis is characterized by the inflammation of the liver. Severe cases are rare in children, yet most recent cases are serious. Experts have ruled out the hepatitis virus and are scrambling to figure out precisely what is causing so many kids to get sick. They found that the numbers of cases are increasing in places where outbreaks have been reported, including in Scotland, where more than a dozen children have come down with the condition. There have been over 100 cases in the UK where the first confirmed case was identified. In addition, Israel, Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, Norway, France, Romania and Belgium have also seen cases. Scientists suspect that adenovirus infections are responsible for the outbreak. Adenoviruses can cause various symptoms, including fevers, pneumonia, diarrhea, pink eye and cold-like symptoms. All nine children who got sick in the U.S. and 75% of the cases in the U.K. tested positive for a specific type of adenovirus. They have been linked with previous hepatitis cases in kids with weakened immune systems, but are not known to cause it in healthy children. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is not thought to be behind the cases. None of the U.S. cases have tested positive for COVID-19 and UK officials have also not found a connection. Evidence of ancient ritual bloodletting. Archaeologists recently announced the discovery of 30 badly weathered ancient rock carvings in southern Mexico that they believe might have been used in bloodletting rituals. Found in the ancient settlement of Quiachapa, they appear to depict eye-shaped ball courts. Based on many discoveries throughout Mesoamerica, it's clear that ball games played an essential role in the region's early cultures. Nobody knows what the rules were, and the shape and appearance of the ball courts changed over time. The game dates back at least 3,600 years and involved two opponents and a rubber ball. Researchers speculate it held religious and ceremonial significance. Quiachapa dates back at least 2,300 years, but the age of the recently discovered carvings is unclear. Study researcher Alex Elvis Badillo told Life Science that they represent the highest density of this particular type of ball court depiction ever found in Mesoamerica. Spanish priest Juan Ruiz de Alarcón, who lived in Mexico following the 16th century Spanish conquest, described seeing Mesoamerican groups practicing rituals that involved spilling blood into small stone cavities. But the researchers admitted that until more evidence is found, they can't say for sure whether rituals were performed at the carvings. Beach Squid The giant squid is somewhat of a legendary creature. Sightings are rare because of their elusive nature and deep-dwelling tendencies. Although the squid is known for its strangeness and size, this species is also thought to have inspired tales of the mythical ship-sinking sea monster known as the Kraken. Beachgoers at Long Beach in South Africa recently found a giant squid carcass washed up along the shore. Its body alone was over 7 feet long, and its tentacles appeared to be nearly 12 feet long, according to Cape Town resident Alison Paulus, who spoke with Live Science. The sighting comes two years after Adele Gross and her husband encountered a stranded giant squid during their daily morning walk in Cape Town, South Africa. Upon spotting the creature along Golden Mile Beach, Adele's first instinct was to try putting it back into the ocean. But when she took a closer look, she realized the squid was dead and was remarkably intact, with no visible injuries. She theorized large swells had washed it ashore the night before. The specimen measured roughly 13 feet long and weighed around 660 pounds. Giant squids typically live at depths between 1,000 and 3,000 feet. Very little is known about these mysterious creatures, which were first captured on camera just 20 years ago. But scientists believe they can grow at least 43 feet long, and that these massive marine animals may very well have inspired the tale of the Kraken and other sea monster legends. Shifting Parasitic Skin Rash Just days after receiving treatment for lung cancer at a hospital in Spain, a 64-year-old man developed a rash of wavy red lines all over his body. The lesions first appeared on his rear end, and doctors were alarmed to notice that they soon migrated elsewhere. The man was also experiencing diarrhea, and a stool test revealed he was infected with a common type of roundworm. The worms were crawling under his skin. 
Infections are typically caused by coming into contact with contaminated soil or human sewage or waste. Most people don't experience any symptoms, and infections usually aren't life-threatening to healthy people. But the patient had recently received steroids that suppress the immune system, making him especially vulnerable to the more severe symptoms that can come with a roundworm infection. The worms can spread to a patient's lungs, liver, brain, heart, and urinary tract in the most serious cases. These infections can be fatal, mainly because they are often diagnosed too late for doctors to provide life-saving treatment. Thankfully, he caught the infection in time and recovered with the help of medication. Giant Amethyst Geodes Early last year in 2021, some amethyst geodes made headlines for their enormous size. Who doesn't love geodes? You might even have some at home, but this specimen was larger than life. One of the rocks weighs a staggering 26,000 pounds and is over 22 feet tall. Others that they found were also huge, weighing around 10,000 pounds. The mineral supplier Nowhere Metals Inc. posted photos of the massive amethyst geodes its workers found in Uruguay's Artigas region. The region is famous for its massive, naturally occurring geodes, which are produced as a result of 120 million years in basalt and groundwater rich in minerals. While Brazil also produces a large quantity of amethyst, amethyst from Artigas in Uruguay tends to be darker with higher quality crystals. People were so shocked by photos of the geodes found in Uruguay that they thought they were fake. The popular fact-checking website Snopes even took a look to see what was up. They determined that the claims were true. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the largest amethyst geode in the world weighs 28,660 pounds and is displayed in the Shandong Tianyu Museum of Natural History in Shandong, China. Another giant geode from Uruguay, about 10.7 feet tall, called the Empress of Uruguay, was at one point the world's largest amethyst geode. Just in the past 10 to 15 years, there has been an increase in larger specimens. The sad thing is that it was vandalized while at a show in Queensland, Australia. A tourist broke off a chunk of crystals. It was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the owner of the crystal cave said it was like slashing the Mona Lisa, but worse because the Empress is one of nature's grand masterpieces. To move this geode that was almost 11 feet tall, it took two large cranes and a special crate built directly around the geode to move it. Imagine trying to move the one that's over 22 feet tall. Gloucester Shipwreck In what experts are calling one of the most important shipwreck discoveries of all time, a warship that sank off the coast of Norfolk, England in 1682 has officially been found. The vessel, known as the Gloucester, was carrying the Duke of York, who later became King James II of England when it sank. He nearly died in the catastrophe when the ship ran aground, ultimately killing over 100 passengers. Divers Julian and Lincoln Barnwell discovered the wreck in 2007, but the find was kept secret until recently due to security concerns. They found it partially buried in the seabed 28 miles from the shore, after spending four years searching for a wreck and nearly giving up. The pair were about to call it quits when they noticed a cannon on the sea floor. At the time, they had no idea how important the discovery was, but they valued it just the same. Speaking with the BBC, Lincoln Barnwell said that it felt special to be one of the only two people in the world who knew, at that moment, where the wreck was. While he and his brother Julian were pretty sure that it was the Gloucester, it wasn't until 2012 that experts positively identified the ship based on the recovery of its bell. In a statement, the Norwich-based University of East Anglia clarified that the vessel was not a slave ship, but that a lot of people from diverse backgrounds lost their lives on it, and that historians will ensure their stories are told. The Source of the Black Death A pandemic known as the Black Death ravaged Europe during the mid-14th century, claiming an estimated 200 million lives across the continent. Its origins have long been a mystery, but a team of scientists believes that they may have identified the root of the illness. Before the study, researchers knew that the plague reached the Mediterranean via cargo ships that arrived from the Black Sea. 
From there, it spread like wildfire, making it difficult for today's experts to figure out exactly where it started. The team detected the earliest known evidence of the disease among a collection of 118 burials found in what is now Kyrgyzstan. One tombstone, belonging to a man named Sanmak, stated that he died of pestilence, causing historian Philip Slavin to wonder if Sanmak and the people buried near him were taken by the Black Death. DNA evidence taken from seven of the bodies proved that the individuals were infected with the Yersinia pestis bacteria when they died, confirming Slavin suspicions. Based on the findings, he and his fellow researchers concluded that the Black Death started in Central Asia. Even more shockingly, the team found a modern, less deadly variant of the bacteria in modern-day rodents that roamed the area where Sanmak's grave was found. They not only connected it to the devastating plague that wiped out an estimated 60% of Europe's and Asia's populations, but to the versions of the bacteria that continue to spread throughout the world today. It's shout-out time! I want to say a big thank you to Relay Hatu and Edmund Noir for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the family, and for more videos about recent archaeological discoveries. Viking Coin in Hungary Archaeologists were baffled recently when a metal detectorist discovered a Viking coin in southern Hungary, far from Scandinavia where it was minted. He handed it over to local experts after unearthing it at the site of a medieval settlement and former trading hub called Kestolk. Known as a penning, the coin was produced in central Norway between 1046 and 1066 for King Harald Sigurdsson III. One side has a symbol representing Christianity's Holy Trinity, known as a Turquetra, while the other side contains a Christian cross and an inscription naming the master of the minting facility. It wasn't worth much at the time despite being made from silver and having an estimated modern value of around $20. Speaking with Live Science, archaeologist Mate Varga explained that the coin was worth roughly the equivalent of the dinar that was being used in Hungary at the time. He said that it was probably enough to feed a family for one day. Hundreds of artifacts have been found at the site, and archaeologists have uncovered ample evidence of contact between ancient Hungarian and Viking societies. This is the first time a Scandinavian coin has been unearthed in Hungary. He explained that the coin may have been lost up to a century after it was minted. Based on this timing, it may be connected to the Hungarian King Solomon, who ruled from 1063 to 1087, and whose court stayed near this site at one point. It's also entirely possible that the coin was brought to the area by a commoner, especially since international traffic was known to pass through. But it's hard to say for sure what the coin saw during its lifetime, if only it could speak and tell its story. Bronze Age Woman Brought to Life During the Bronze Age, nearly 4,000 years ago, a petite, dark-haired woman lived in what is now the Czech Republic in Central Europe. She was a member of the Unetic culture, which is historically known for its metal artifacts. When she died sometime between 1880 BC and 1750 BC, she was buried in the area known as Bohemia, with lavish grave goods. It's clear, based on the five bronze bracelets, two gold earrings, and the necklace with 500 amber beads surrounding her, that the woman was incredibly wealthy. She was probably one of the region's richest residents at the time. Her grave was dug up thousands of years later with her skull in remarkably good condition. It was practically intact. The researchers were even able to get some of her DNA. This is how they determined that the woman had fair skin and brown hair. Experts recently created a model of what she would have looked like, recreating her appearance in stunning detail that helps to bring the past to life in ways that, until recently, simply weren't possible. The team managed to obtain DNA samples from other skeletons in the cemetery and are currently working to determine if and how the individuals buried there are related. These and other findings could help to determine what the regional differences were between factions of the Unetic culture. Thousands of Frogs While excavating along a roadside in Cambridge, England, archaeologists unearthed more than 8,000 prehistoric frog bones. They made the strange find near an Iron Age settlement that was inhabited from around 400 BC to 43 AD. Finding a frog skeleton is not an unusual discovery in and of itself, but the sheer quantity of them was bizarre. Most of the bones belonged to the common toad and common frog, 
but researchers also found evidence of the pool frog, which is not seen as frequently as the others, at archaeological sites. It's unclear why the frogs died in such a large number, and scientists admittedly may never know the answer to this question, but they noted that the frog was seen as a fertility symbol among numerous ancient cultures, including the Egyptians, Mesopotamians, Greeks, and Romans. There are no cut or burn marks on the bones, indicating that the residents of the nearby settlement did not eat the amphibians. It's also possible that the villagers boiled and ate the frogs, which would explain the absence of marks on the bones. The frogs may have been attracted to the site by its crops, which are known to draw beetles and other pests that frogs feed on. They may have also been a victim of some sort of prehistoric frog tragedy, including, for instance, becoming trapped in a ditch while moving in large numbers in search of breeding waters. Extreme cold is another possible factor and may have killed off hibernating frogs. They may have also died from disease. For now, the mystery endures, but archaeologists are working to come up with an explanation for the frog skeletons. Surprise Human Burials While excavating at the Neolithic site of Tel Karasa in modern-day Syria back in 2009 and 2010, archaeologists came across 14 human burials. The discovery was made shortly before the ongoing Syrian civil war began, and the graves were unearthed just in time for scientists to perform DNA tests. Much to the team's surprise, the remains of a man and woman were dated back to the late 7th and early 8th centuries, to a period known as the Umayyad era. They had expected the skeletons to be much older than they were, and would have never realized without radiocarbon dating that the graves were consistent with early Muslim burial practices. The couple's DNA indicates that they were more closely related to modern-day Bedouins and Saudis than to the region's Levantine population, according to evolutionary biologist Megha Srijan. She conceded that most of the data wasn't complete yet, but that all signs point toward the pair being members of a transient group that migrated far from their homeland. This not only indicates an early Muslim presence in Syria, it serves as evidence of the spread of Islamic cultural and religious practices into the Levant. What may seem like a small discovery has proven to be what researcher Christina Valdiosera described as a small but remarkable piece of the colossal puzzle of the region's history. Medieval Monastery During the 14th century, Turkish pirates attacked a Christian monastery in northern Greece. Someone left behind a single-edged sword or a saber that was wielded by either one of the intruders or one of the people defending the monastery. Archaeologists found the weapon at the site in the early 2000s, and the discovery was hailed as remarkable, since most iron weapons from the time have disintegrated. While the style of the sword is unusual, researchers found that both Turks and Byzantines used similar types of weapons during the period when the battle occurred. Located along the Aegean shoreline, the monastery of Agios Nikolaos of Chryso Camaros is undergoing continued excavations. Today, it's a noticeably peaceful place, but this wasn't always the case. Throughout the 14th century alone, three major military events occurred at the site. Research has revealed that the monastery was surrounded by a sturdy granite wall measuring between 5.5 and 6 feet thick, according to archaeologist Theodoros Dogas, who spoke with Live Science. A tower found at the site contained evidence of seas, indicating that it was used for storing a grain supply when the monastery was still in operation. While the tower measures 16 feet high today, evidence suggests that it was once much taller and that it was badly damaged in a fire at some point. In a recent paper, researchers theorized that the tower was destroyed after a raid. Pottery vessels found at the site indicate that the destruction happened sometime during the second half of the 14th century or the beginning of the 15th. The mystery of who brandished the single-bladed sword remains unsolved. Domesticating Chickens Two recently published studies suggest that chicken domestication began in Southeast Asia around 3,500 years ago and that it coincided with early grain cultivation. Researchers don't think that chickens were originally domesticated for food, but as exotic or culturally revered pets, according to one of the studies. From there, it appears as though chickens were transported westward. In the words of zoo archaeologist Joris Peters, cereal cultivation may have acted as a catalyst for chicken domestication. Archaeologist Julia Best reported in another research piece that domesticated fowl arrived in the Mediterranean no earlier than 2,800 years ago, 
before appearing in Northwest Africa between 1,100 and 800 years ago. The debate over where human-raised chickens came from goes back at least a half century, with India's Indus Valley, Northern China, and Southeast Asia all being proposed as possible points of origin. DNA evidence has failed to prove when chickens were first domesticated, while other evidence suggests that it happened sometime between 10,500 and 4,000 years ago. One team of experts examined chicken bones that were found at over 600 sites in 89 countries and traced the earliest known domestic chicken to a rice farming site in central Thailand called Ban Non Wat. They theorized that sometime between 1650 BC and 1250 BC, wild birds were attracted to the grain crops and became familiar with the humans who planted them leading to the earliest domestication of what eventually became the modern chicken. While the findings haven't been proven, all signs point toward researchers being on the right track, including more recent chicken remains found in other parts of the world, which indicate that the practice of raising fowl arrived later on. Thanks for watching! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time for more amazing discoveries. Bye!